Welcome to another episode of Lessons in Product Management. Today I have on Peter Knudsen and Braxton Bragg, who both started off their career in product at Zynga. And since then, they've worked for a number of big name companies and a variety of roles. Today, Braxton is director of product for Leica, and Peter is in the product strategy org at EA Sports. And they came on to talk about their new book, Product Sense, and how you can build product sense to build your product career and land your first product job. So I'm super excited for you to get to know them, get to know more about their book and hear about what they have to say. We covered a lot of topics. We covered a lot of ground in what's almost an hour long uh, conversation. We had some great Q&A from our live audience. So if you're interested in joining our live audience, go to pathtoproduct.io where you can stay up to date with all the latest events that are coming out If you are listening on the podcast, please drop us a rating and review on the Apple Podcast app. If you're listening on Spotify, please hit that follow button. And anywhere else, we'd love to hear your feedback. You can go to anchor.fm slash lessons in product management and leave us a voice message. So if you want to be uh, shouted out on the podcast, we can uh, add your question into the podcast. We can answer it live on the podcast. And um, you can always get that live interaction by following us at pathtoproduct.io. So um, can't wait to dive in. So with no further ado, here's Peter and Braxton. Hey, Peter, Braxton, welcome to the podcast. Hey, good to be here. Thanks for having us, John. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for the listeners out there, could you give a brief introduction of yourself? I know um, you both have been around product management for a long time, for a lot of really great companies, and, and so have learned a lot, which has uh, informed the book that you just wrote, Product Sense, and, and we'll dive into that. But could we start out with some intros? Sure, I'll start. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Peter Knudsen. Uh, I live in San Francisco, California, and I'm a co-author of Product Sense along with Braxton. Um, I've been in product management for my whole career. So around like a little over 10 years now um, and pretty much in the gaming space. I think I was on uh, one of John's podcasts before about talking about the gaming world, but I, I where I met Braxton was at Zynga. And then I stayed in the um, gaming space for basically the rest of my time. Uh, currently I'm in electronic arts as a product uh, in the product strategy d- discipline. And uh, continuing, love to talk about product management and having seen it from different angles inside of these companies. Um, I, you know, I was interested to put those thoughts to paper with the book, and Braxton made a really good co-author. Um, how about you, Brax? Hi, everybody. Braxton Bragg, uh, calling from New York City. Um, I've been in product management for uh, a little less time than Peter. I think I started back in 2013, actually. So. Um, kind of going on uh, just around eight years for me now. Um, it's actually a second career for me. I started my career before business school in public accounting and then worked in finance and accounting at a non- large nonprofit as well. Um, so then went to business school, then kind of broke into the, the PM space. Uh, so yeah, I live in um, uh, Queens with my wife and my daughter and my, our two dogs. I'm currently director of product at Leica, but as Pete mentioned, we met uh, early on at Zynga and I've worked at a few other startups as well. Uh, including another gaming startup called Scopely. Um, I worked at Weebly and I did a two and a half year stint at McKinsey and Company as well. Not on the consulting side, but actually working on their website and their mobile app. Very cool. So, um, and, and you guys got to, to meet and know each other at Zynga, right? That's what you said earlier. That's right. Uh, yeah, we started actually on the same day. I think it was August 8th, 2013. Nice, good memory. <laughs> Could be wrong, but I think that's right. Yeah, and and at the risk of kind of jumping into some of the interview questions early, I think one of the central themes of the book actually that we wanted to instill was this concept of a boot camp in a book because both Braxton and I found that initial like two weeks or three weeks intensive on product management that the different product leaders at Zynga were giving us to be really invaluable and that um, there are certain, you know, people who want to break into product management would really benefit from something like this, but there's, there's not really, they, there are some things out there, they're expensive, there's, it's dubious whether or not it's worth it. Um, some of, some of them might, might be, but even if you're a new product manager at a startup, you're not going to get that too. So what we, what we really wanted to do was try to distill down that experience into a book format. And that's, and we talk about that a little bit in the introduction. 
very cool. And, and that was my, my first question was like, what was the, the driver behind the book? What was like the market need that you saw? So thanks for, thanks for outlining that. Yeah. Well, we can expound on that a little bit too. I mean, like in, in the end of the day, like, and I'll, I'll say my piece and I know Braxton's coming at it from a, a different angle as well. But for me, what I, what I saw was that, that since our book is primarily about how to get people who um, aren't, you know, maybe they aren't product managers get their first job, or if they're relatively new in their career and they're trying to switch careers, what I felt was missing was that a comprehensive look at that and how to actually do that. I think there's some some ways you can focus really, really on the in interviews and figuring out a framework. And then those candidates, I feel like missed the mark because they only they're kind of reciting a parroting out a, a, a rigid framework that doesn't sound supernatural. Or you can think about the logistics of the how to get a job, which there are some books that tell you exactly what are the steps to do it, but they don't tell you exactly how to do it. So product sense is supposed to be kind of like a handhold through the whole process, starting with the fundamentals and then um, going into an interview framework, which we do, we designed a new one and then a uh, walkthrough of the process. The idea being that there's plenty of really capable product managers out there. Everyone has product sense. Um, who aren't making it through the process because they weren't really taught or trained how to hone or strengthen that product sense. And so that, that's, we, you know, the world would be a better place if more, if more capable product managers were able to make it through the system. That's, that's my motivation anyway. Um, Braxton, what about you? Yeah, I, I think I agree with everything that you said. I, I would also add that um, although there are a couple of other books that tackle this space, um, the space of aspiring product managers who really want some deeper resources to look to, to figure out how to go out and look for the job and, and get the job, that uh, they've been around for some number of years. We thought we could have a fresher take. Um, we also wanted to focus on really the differences in product management, not only across different types of companies, but within companies. And we think that's a space that maybe hasn't been explored as much. Um, so we thought we could add some value there as PMs who've uh, experienced product management and, and contributed to the field, hopefully, in a few different um, types of uh, spaces. Um, and yeah, I think for for each of us too, uh, the the genesis or at least the the catalyst for the um, starting the, the book writing process was a trip I took out to San Francisco. Pete and I met up, and uh, we realized we had both been doing some some coaching for PM candidates. Um, Pete has been working more independently. I had been doing mine through the Career Management Center at Columbia Business School, so aspiring kind of PMs from the MBA classes there. And uh, both of us independently wanted to write books, but it's a huge undertaking. And we thought that by partnering up, we could not only bring a more diverse perspective to, to bear between the two of our careers, um, but also keep each other on task and, and uh, um, really have like interesting debates, I think, about how to voice the message that we're trying to get across. I, I love the, the the collaborative approach and kind of bouncing ideas off each other. And uh, I love how you, you said even debating, right? Because <clears throat> like what happens within product management itself, we often find ourselves debating within our team and, and amongst uh, our, our peers and stuff. So it's uh, it's very real life as you as you took your product management experience and then I guess treat, in some ways treating the book like a product and trying to form it and shape it and into what it ultimately became. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think I think you were spot on with with what the intent was of creating a, a boot camp in a book. And I love the chronological aspect of it where you prioritized how does product management happen? Like what is it? How do you do it? And like what should you care about? What should you like be doing through the process and then focus on the interviews? Because I think to your point, in a lot of the the forums and communities I'm in, you know, the question always comes up of how do I ace this interview? And it's like, well, even if you knew how to answer every question, right? Like when you got the job, those answers to those specific questions won't help you execute on your job day to day. So I, I love the the focus on like how to do product management first before you get the interview. Um, yeah. what was was there intentional thought behind like the chronology of how you wrote it? Yeah, I, I, there absolutely was. And, and thanks for calling that out because it's kind of like, you know, we can give you a tool, but it will be useless if you don't know how to actually like wield it or whatever. Um, and so that's why ours follows a somewhat semi-intentional flow where we first like the, the structure of the book is first trying to kind of like we call it ferreting out the common denominators of product management uh, into a, kind of like a what we we summarizing it as like the, the number one question that PM needs to answer is what should we build and why, and then there's some concepts out of that come out of that one, and that's part one of the book, and then part two of the book, which is called the Compass Framework, which is that tool that is presumably once we kind of 
teach you the concepts that you need to know, then here's a tool that maps right to those concepts, which you can apply to the interview. And so that's why we, we really like, you know, we wanted to focus on that first part. And that's what took probably the hardest part for us to, during the editing process was getting that, that flow and structure right, such that it made total sense about what you would need to know for that interview framework, which you would go and do for product sentence, product execution, product leadership questions that now you can go and ace those ones. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, what we were thinking. Braxton, do you have anything else you want to add? Yeah, one other thing I'd call out, I, I think what's so important if you're thinking about going down this path of researching and practicing to interview for PM jobs, if you haven't done it before, is determining whether you really want to commit to it. Um, one of our early interviews with another product leader, uh, Matt Salazar, who was then at Nike, is now, uh, I think, GM of product management product management and growth at Epic Games, if I remember correctly, uh, he was calling out how the people who stick around in product management really have uh, found their passion. It's it's more, there are jobs where you can make money and have sort of like a less all-consuming lifestyle. I think to, to be in product, you really have to commit to it. And we give a lot of context for what life as a product manager is like and the various things that you'll have to do. I think at the end of the day, are you a, you're a utility player, uh, you are a problem solver, it's an endless journey of learning and that should all appeal to you. If not, then you're probably not going to be happy or successful and you should maybe get through that part of our book and stop and go find something else that you want to do where you will be happier and more successful. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, just to build on something, uh, John, you were saying earlier, like Brax and I treating our book like a product sort of, which is definitely kind of came true because we were ad trying to identify like, personas of readers that we were trying to target even before doing any putting anything to paper and that uh Braxton hit on one of them which was like we wanted to provide a resource as well for people who like are curious about product management and uh don't know if it's for them there's some you know it's one of our target personas and I think we we found that like from some of our early readers in that persona that they found it valuable in that way too which I think was like it's a nice bonus um that I, I think that our book provides that maybe others do not yeah, totally. I, I use this analogy all the time where when I was in elementary school, I was slow, I was flat footed and I tried to play soccer and I was really bad and I got put on the bench and I was really glad because, you know, nowadays it's like every kid plays or a kid gets, gets a trophy. And, and, and it's sad because like I wasn't good, but if I was made to believe that I was good at it, I could have like pursued a thing that I would never have been really good at versus focusing on something I could have been. So I, I love that approach of like helping people see what path they should take based on the reality of the situation. But yeah. on that note, like, are, are there, are there things that you would call out maybe teasing out parts of the book <laughs> where um, for, for the one listening who is aspiring to, to get into product management, what are some like one or two key things they should be aware of before they get in that like they might not think exist today? Um, Braxton, you got some? Yeah, no, I was I was taking a moment to reflect. I mean, I, I think there are a lot of big companies out there hiring lots of PMs, right? And that can be a, a path in. And I think we were talking about this a little bit before we got started too, uh, rotational PM programs or APM programs, right? Um, and I think those are, if you've never been in product management before, maybe that's the thing that you've heard of. Um, but maybe you already work at a tech company and there's no product management function or there is one and it's small um, and there's an opportunity for more PMs to join and kind of bring different experiences to bear or tackle different aspects of the problem that the custom, that the, the, the company is trying to solve for their customer. And I, I think that's all worth considering. Um, we, we also talk about at various points throughout the book, kind of the path that you can take in a product management, right? And, and I'm kind of alluding to that too, with those big uh, APM rotational programs or PM rotational programs, but, um, you might not have to change companies at all. Maybe you can find a way to contribute to uh, through the work that you're already doing to the product org's mission and make a case for why you should rebrand yourself there as a product manager. So I think that's that's a recurring theme that we we talk about indirectly or directly at various times that might not be obvious to someone outside the field. Yeah, exactly. That, and to build on the last point Braxton was saying, that that's one that 
I like the path from internal kind of transfer from another discipline is one of the themes that we kind of really uncovered through some research that we did for this book. And that I, I've seen more and more in my career as well, where people coming from customer support or sales or engineering, anybody um, who can, who has just had an interest or passion in product and building the right kinds of relationships inside their org uh, could in theory do it as long as they, they're going to get that shot if they have good relationships. And then it's about kind of like, just getting those fundamentals honed and um, in a way that like you can be effective once you get that shot. No, for sure. Um, no, I, I agree. I, I think in a lot of the conversations I've had, there's, there's a, a ton of different paths into product management and it's um, you know, it's really finding what path is going to work for you and may, maybe trying different ones to, to figure that out. But, uh, but yeah, uh, there's no one size fits all path into product. Um, on the on the side of product management that I think you, you had mentioned earlier, uh, Braxton, like it, all, all, can, all consuming nature of it, right? Um, I think a lot of people read LinkedIn or, or different like thought leadership pieces about work life balance, and I want to get into tech for work life balance because unlimited PTO and all these fun things that that companies pr- promote. Um, what what has been the reality in your experience around? Um, I guess the the expectations of, of product managers in the day to day. I think, like anything, it, it can depend a lot. Uh, maybe maybe on where you are in your career, uh, on which company you're a part of, on the leadership at that company at that time, um, what product you're working on, and the needs that it has at that moment, or maybe if you're trying to launch a new product, do you have some deadlines that are looming for some reason? So um, I, what I didn't mean to imply is that there is no work-life balance in the career of product management. I think there there certainly can be, but there there isn't always. I think the often the buck stops with the product manager or the product leader. Um, being a servant leader is really important and and showing up is really important. Um, making sure that if your, your team is working, that they feel supported and that if there are any gaps in knowledge or uh, some role that needs to be filled, like the PM often has to step in and do that. And that's where it can be a little difficult. I've spent most of my career in, in uh, B2C, so consumer facing products. And one disadvantage of that type of product is they're, they're always on. Uh, so in gaming, for example, there's always revenue coming in. If something breaks, um, certainly the PM is one of those people that probably is very soon aware of that and may have some responsibility with respect to resolving whatever is wrong. Um, in, in B2B, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, for, for most of my current users, for example, they're probably not working on weekends. So um, if if work-life balance for whatever place you are in your life at this time is important, uh, that may be a consideration for you as you're thinking about what type of product role might be best for you. And and to build on uh, what Braxton was saying, uh, all in, all consuming is another is an interesting thing to say because uh, one thing I see PMs do time and time again is like let the product that they're working on really like dictate their own mental health, not necessarily from a work-life balance, like working 16 hours a week. But if, you know, for some reason, a stakeholder is giving feedback about the product and they'll take it personally, or that it's so, it becomes so much of their baby that they'll make decisions that are for the best for the business because it's, they're so personally invested in it. And it's easy in it because you're so focused on it all the time that it's hard not to, but that's just a, that's another way that it can kind of like control your life balance, even if it's not from an hours perspective, but maybe from a mental health perspective. This might be on a little bit of a lighter note, but I find that I have found that the, because product management is such a, as I use the, the term all consuming uh, profession, I think aspects of it and the mindset that it, it engenders in its practitioners can kind of bleed into one's personal life as well. So sometimes it's difficult for me to take a step back from my role as a product manager in my relationship with my wife. And uh, if I approach problem solving with her the same way I would with my teams, it may not be appropriate for the context with her. So I don't know if you've had that issue as well, Pete, but. Uh, oh my God. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I had a three year relationship with another product manager and that was, it was weird. We were constantly trying to optimize things and maybe in an unhealthy way. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's something of the scientist and the product manager, and you don't, you can't always be a scientist in the way that you approach interpersonal relations. So that's uh, maybe a pitfall to be aware of. Yeah, for sure. Totally. Yeah, I've seen it with my wife and kids too. Definitely, definitely been there. <laughs> cool. So, um, for for the aspiring PM listening, who's like they, they've heard there's multiple paths to get there, right? And and they 
they want to pick up your book, they, they want to get started. Um, what is, what is one thing you would point to, or maybe a couple things you would point to is like maybe first up, say they're like brand new on the journey. They have no clue what product management is, but it sounds interesting and they want to, they want to explore it. Is there, is there anything they should look into first or be aware of first before even like taking their first steps down the journey? Well, I will jump in and, and I'm sure Brecht, Brecht and I, actually, this is interesting. We were on a podcast the other day talking about this exact topic. We have different points of view, so I think you'll probably get varied perspectives. Um, well, I think for, first step is probably to decide if this is like something you really want to do. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's easy for people to be like, oh, I want to be in tech, but I'm not an engineer. I don't know. I don't want to go to a coding boot camp. So what else do I have available for me, right? And product management sounds sexy because you can be in charge of deciding what people want to build. That's what you think anyway. And that like, that's why you want to go into it. And that might be going into it for the wrong reasons. So I think like getting a first step is like understanding what, what is it that you're going to be doing? Um, and like either reading product sense is one way to go or talking to other PMs that um, are at other companies about their day-to-day -day experience would be kind of see, and seeing if that excites you with the things that you will be doing um, is probably a, a good first step. Uh, Braxton, what do you think? You want to build on that? Yeah, I, I think talking to PMs, right? So um, there are a few communities you can join, either Slack workspaces or Facebook groups, uh, if you don't know any PMs personally, but talking to them about what their work is like, what their lives are like, um, what they like about being a PM, what they dislike about being, um, uh, being a PM, excuse me. Uh, and then honestly, I mean, not to toot our own horn too much, but I, I think our book is a good starting place too. Like we wrote it exactly for that type of person. Yep, cool. And, and so you, you both worked in, in B2B and B2C. And I get a question a lot about what's the difference. And I, I have some thoughts. I've given those thoughts, but I'd love to hear from both of you. I'm actually at a B2B company now. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, I, I could start. Uh, so from my perspective, uh, working in B2C for a long time, I think big, especially big company uh, product management, you're doing a lot of experimentation or A-B testing. You're also probably doing a lot of uh, data analysis and uh, worrying about the taxonomy of your product. And small changes in your product can make a big difference to the company's top line, uh, to conversion, to um, retention, et cetera. And you're keeping a really close eye on those metrics all the time. I used to describe product management, um, especially in that context as being sort of a, you're, you're like the doctor for the product and you wanna quickly identify if anything's wrong, diagnose it and figure out how to fix it. Um, I think in a B2B context, especially at a smaller company, um, you know, I, my company doesn't have that many customers yet. Within those customers, there's not necessarily a ton of users either. So we're a little less dependent on the data than I would say I have been previously. Um, I haven't been doing as much. I, I, we actually don't do any A-B testing at this point. So we're doing a lot more talking directly to customers. We're doing a lot more uh, research with our internal stakeholders as well as we figure out um, how to fix pain points in the product, uh, how to also identify what our roadmap looks like on a, a macro and a micro basis. And I'll build off of what Braxton said. He definitely covered some really good points there. Um, one thing I will like to add is that in the end of the day, like the difference the, the there what you do at a b2c company and what you do at a b2b company in, in our opinion is the same right it's you're trying to uncover what the customer problem is in a b2c company you have what a million maybe you have millions of users you can't talk to each individual one one at a time so you use the data as your tool tool to achieve the user research right in a b2b company where one customer can be bringing in millions of dollars then you weight heavily on that piece of data where what they're saying, what their workflows are that need fixing and what are the problems that they need to be solved. That, that one individual customer matters a lot more than an individual customer on the BDC side. But in the end of the day, they're, they're just tools to achieve the same objective. And so understanding the principles of both, even if you're, or like the higher level principles will make you an attractive generalist PM that can get jo jobs at other places. Yeah, I think that's really well said. Uh, so philosophically, there's maybe little or no difference. Strategically, there's some difference. I think tactically, there can be maybe more differences. Yeah, and the general feedback I typically give when I get asked is that like in a, in a B2C context, you'll have a, a higher focus on, on quantitative data, where in B2B, you'll have a lot more qualitative input. But but I'm I curious yeah. on, on the consumer side of things, like is there is there an approach to qualitative data that works well? 
You know, it's interesting. It's because we talked to a number of like uh, people for in research for our book who are in higher up positions at different companies. And they were saying as the product management discipline has, and this is our experience as well, has matured over the years, maybe the last decade has been, at first it started so quantitative that any qualitative data was just useless because that's just one person, but look at the data, right? But there's no context to that data. So you see a number drop and you're like, oh, okay, I now I'm going to make an assumption on why I think that is, but I'm not, I, I don't go out and actually talk to somebody and try to get that in that qualitative data of in hearing that. And that's one of our hypotheses on that drop, for example. So it, it's a mix. And even at a huge scale company, I think it's, it's, it's important to get us to, you know, get in the trenches and talk to a customer and hear what they say and use that as an important piece of data as well. Even if it's not something you need to immediately action on right then and there, but it's helped building the story about what your customers are doing and how are they liking your product. Um, Braxton, what do you think? Yeah, when I when I worked in gaming, uh, we had certainly some users who were more highly engaged would spend a lot more on in-app uh, transactions. And even if you have a subscription model, you're going to have users who are much more highly engaged as well. And these are the folks you uh, you definitely want to be aware of how they're using the product, what they like about the product. They're probably out there promoting your product in many cases too. So it's um, in many cases like a good it's a good idea to understand them, to know them, to uh, make sure that you're continuing to retain them over the longer term. Um, so yeah, even though we didn't have um, as direct contact with them as maybe I have now in a B2B context, context we were surveying them, uh, we were emailing them, we were reviewing the support tickets that that they created or caused to be created. Um, and we were uh, in some cases like having focus groups with them or inviting them to our headquarters and getting to know them better, taking them out to dinner even in some cases. So I think that's, that's still really important in a consumer context. Awesome. Awesome. I, I know we're starting to get some some questions in the chat, and we'll we'll jump to Q and A in a second. But I, I wanted to ask one more question about the book before we jump into into the Q and A side. Um, for for those who haven't picked up the book yet, the Compass Framework, big piece of the book. Um, tease that out a little bit. What what should the reader expect uh, from from the Compass Framework? Okay, sure. I'll start. Um, so like we were alluding to earlier, like the compass framework is based off of the fundamentals that PMs need to know to demonstrate to an interviewer to show that they have the basics of the, that they can do the job, <clears throat> which is uh, in part one of the book, the question that we say every PM needs to answer, regardless of the company or industry is what should we build and why that's the, you know, at any point, that's really what we're trying to figure out. There's the why being the most important part, trying to frame the problem business objective. And that's being the best, like the most important part of the question that brings out the what. what. So when you go into the compass framework, there's, it's basically five steps, high level steps. The fifth step is what are we building, right? And then it's the, just the top, it's the four steps basically that you need to do before you even decide to do that. In, a, in an interview section or interview session, what you decide or tell, like say the question is, design me something or what should we build in this instance or how should we solve this problem? What should we do to solve this problem? What you actually come up with at the end step is the least important. It's your thought process going through to arrive at that conclusion collaboratively with the interviewer um, in a structured way that um, touches on all the major points. So that's kind of the, the reason why the Compass Framework exists, exists. And I think that's the biggest, the biggest problem I see when coaching people to get new jobs is that they get really hung up on the what the solution that they want to design is. And we really wanted to reiterate that it's good, it's nice if you come up with a really cool feature, but that's the least important part. And the like how you are identifying the problems to solve is, is, is what the interviewer is looking for. Yeah, I, I, th I think one of the most underserved topics, and, and it's changing a little bit in, in kind of the mainstream content that's out there, but like discovery, the discovery process is traditionally been more underserved than the delivery process, but it's, I think, more broadly, it's, it's probably still the most focused aspect of product management from those who are trying to break into the field. So yeah. um, I love that the book is, is kind of tailored towards that, that front end part. Yeah, and I'll just add to as a as a hiring manager, and this predates when when Pete and I started working on the book, and when we um, sort of crystallized the Compass framework, the rubric that I've used as a hiring manager for several years has incorporated lots of different elements of a PM's response to a case question or a take home exercise. It's and 
you know, the, only one of those is is the solution. Um, we care much more about the journey of how they got there. And what we were trying to do with the Compass Framework is provide our readers and, and those who are aspiring PMs who get into these situations, you know, how to walk the interviewer through your thought process, which will hopefully demonstrate and give a clear um, signal that's much less likely to be a, a false positive or a negative that they're the type of person who would be good to collaborate with on real problems that a PM might solve with design and engineering and other colleagues. For sure. So we have we do have some questions in the in the chat. And uh, if more come in, we'll, we'll cover those. But one of the first ones I, I also hear a lot is what type of technical knowledge should a PM have or should they expect to be interviewed on? I have a feeling I know the first part of the answer, but uh, take it away, guys. Yeah, this one <clears throat> this one comes up a lot in these uh, Facebook groups or forums about like, oh yeah, should I what coding language should I know or like certification should I get, or like how much SQL am I going to have to do on a day to day basis? And my 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 answer is always like, in theory, you shouldn't have to really know any of this stuff. Like the the important parts, for example, data analysis, if you're going to do a B2B, B2C company with a lot of users, like you're going to have to have some familiarity with the concept of like analyzing data. But in those bigger companies, like people are largely specialized to, some, to most degrees, right? Engineering is going to do the engineering. Uh, it's, you're going to likely have a data analyst or business analyst as part of your cross-functional pod. And while it's beneficial it, somewhat, to being able to like write your own SQL queries to save time. It's not something that is really, in my experience, ever valued so highly enough that one perfectly great product manager is gonna get taken over for a slightly worse one who knows SQL. And like in that instance, for example, <clears throat> it's about asking the right questions that frame the data analysis plan and your familiarity with the customer and what questions to ask is the most important part there, which is PM fundamental, not the ability to do the SQL um, part of that. Same goes for engineering, like being able to have nice and productive engineering discussions with your counterparts, but not necessarily about specific solutions. Because as a PM, you only care if the business outcome is achieved and the problem for the user is solved. How it's done shouldn't be something that's necessarily um, up to product, actually, in my opinion. It should be, we're trying to figure out what are, what are our objectives and why those are important, why is the strategy chosen in such a way, and that like we're going to work collaboratively across design and product and business analysts and sales and whatever to come up with that solution that's going to solve those problems. Um, that's that's my monologue anyway. Uh, go ahead, Braxton. Yeah, and I, I, I'll just add, I think there are going to be founders and hiring managers out there who do want technical PMs, folks who either have a CS background, perhaps, or years working in engineering before they shifted into product. And that's okay. I mean, they can want that. Um, I, I think you're probably, in most cases, not going to be able to, as a candidate, change their minds about that if you don't have that type of background. And I've run into those um, as, a, as an, uh, someone who's uh, an applicant for, for various roles, I, I haven't necessarily met the technical bar. And that's okay. Like, I don't want to go do a job where I'm, I'm basically not going to be good at it because the problems they're solving are more technical or the expectations of, of the people I'm going to be working for are just beyond my my ability to deliver at this point in my career, given kind of the, the, the technical knowledge that I have. Um, but I agree with Pete, like ideally you shouldn't have to have a lot of technical knowledge for most PM roles. Um, the, the one thing I tell a lot of, I, I do ask my candidates if they uh, know any SQL and basically that's a pretty easy thing to go out and familiarize yourself with within you know, a couple of weekends or something, taking some free or relatively inexpensive courses. And then you at least look like you've, you've tried, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think what's more important to me as a hiring manager is you don't pretend to know things that you don't know uh, in the technical realm and that you are intellectually curious and know how to ask good questions of your engineering right. partners. And that's how you earn credibility too. Like the engineers will much more respect someone who is open-minded about learning new things and will challenge them uh, as thought partners, um, not necessarily someone who's going to know all the technical details right. or provide a different technical solution. Yeah, and it definitely does. I mean, as Braxton was saying, a lot of it depends on the type, the company, the size of the company, as in startups, you have to wear way more hats than you would at a bigger company. 
Um, FANG companies, they ge generally probably less on the technical skills, except for the notable, notable exception of Google, where it's engineering uh, founders and very heavy engineering culture there. Um, so that's also something to pay attention to. So if the, if the company is very like a uh, technical product or the founders value technical skills, like being able to code, um, you may be asked some of those baseline questions, but if the hiring managers or founders are, you know, following industry standards, then the engineering technical skills of a PM should matter a lot less. Um, but that, that again, some hiring managers don't know what they want from a PM and there's nothing you can really do in those instances. Yeah, Peter, I, I liked your take on like PMs really shouldn't even like feel like they own the solution. Like that should be a collaborative conversation between design, development, and product. But like our core job is really precisely defining the problem and prioritizing which problems we solve based on the why that business objective that we're trying to we're trying to get to. Yeah, and that's 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 my high level you know ideals and what actually happens. There's a lot of organizations out there that do hiring in very different ways, and so yeah. how you and I uh, feel about the what the ideal state is and what the reality is sometimes is a mismatch, unfortunately. But hopefully, as we you know as we continue to write books and do podcasts and train other PMs to be PMs, we can see a shift to more you know more specialized in the problem solving part. Yeah. And I think Teresa Torres has mentioned, mentioned this on a, a talk or maybe even in her book, I'm reading it right now. Um, but how like we train PMs to do things in the ideal way, right? Like Marty Kagan's kind of one, one of the, the thought leaders in this space. Um, and, and there's like the ideal way to go about things. And as, as PMs, like we try to, but we, to your point, we might not be in an organization that enables us to do that. And so like one of the problems that, that I've seen in some of the, the aspiring PMs that I've coached is like once they've gotten that PM job, the things that we taught or the processes or the way, the way to do things, like they're running into organizational hurdles to actually implement things in the way that they think it should be, should be done in the way that it's taught. Is there any, any advice uh, on like leading up through those processes of like helping persuade or, or convince or like any best practices around helping to navigate those organizational challenges that you've seen? Uh, Braxton, I feel like you're, you're really suited to help answer this question. Uh, sorry, organizational challenges around, around what exactly? The um, being able to execute product, the product discipline and the ideal way versus the jacked up way that they stepped into. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think one step at a time. Uh, <laughs> uh, change change is always hard, right? So, so coming into uh, a new role, perhaps, or a new organization, and bringing maybe a different perspective uh, on how product management should be practiced. Um, just like anything else you do as a PM, you have to develop the relationships with your partners and stakeholders and um, make small changes here and there, I would say, uh, that are based on your credibility and ability to sell why those changes should be made, right? And I think uh, we've said it a few times already on, on in, during this chat that product is, is practiced different, differently everywhere, right? So right. there's no there's no perfect theory of product management that you can apply to every context. And that could be because of the product, the organization, the team size or disposition. There's so many different elements that go into what we do and how we do it that it's, it's about taking the right lessons and applying them uh, to your circumstances as best you can. And um, I think we do this with Scrum too, right? There's there's an ideal version of Scrum, but none of us are, are quite there, I think, with respect to how we how we work in an agile way. Yeah, we'll have to have you back on to talk about Scrum versus Kanban and like the whole product, <laughs> the, the, the whole product owner thing. I have strong yeah. thoughts on, on yeah. that. But, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So we have another question in the chat um, around, PMP certifications and if they help. And I think more broadly, we can just ask like for, from a hiring perspective or just what, what you've seen in the field, do, do certifications bear any weight or, or if they help, how? Um, for me, I've tried to design an interview process that will tease out a, a candidate's capabilities and the way that they approach problems. Um, I'm not necessarily putting much weight on like what they do or don't have on their resume um, other than like 
sort of some experience in product if you're applying for a product manager or more senior position. I think APMs can potentially be entry level. Um, so that said, um, it, it might be a nice to have uh, if if that's something that is a good path for you to learn about product, then I would encourage it. I think there are other ways to learn about product as well. There are lots of other ways. So whatever makes the most sense for you. And I'll add on to this. And one thing just to call out here is that uh, a lot of our, you know, what we're saying here is largely very North America centric. Um, I think that like from the Silicon Valley, New York tech scene, like PMP would not, it's not something that you normally see. A PMP is more for project management than anything else anyway. Um, and that you see uh, in these fan companies that are, you know, things that have uh, headquarters in the Bay Area or somewhere else in the North America, you probably won't see very much heavy emphasis on having any kind of certifications. And I think you can get certified in some other of these boot camp type things, um, which are the weight of that, you know, like it largely depends on like really like how strong you are in the interview. And that will maybe the, maybe those certifications will get you a little bit further in some degrees, but in the end of the day, I don't think they're, re they're required. And then that's being said though, like I think, you know, it might in your local market, if you have a specific local tech scene and that's weighted differently, we can't necessarily speak for all locales. Um, so it may be helpful uh, in those situations, but from our experiences, which largely are in North American tech companies, um, your strength in the interview, your the network that you've uh, that's kind of referred you, or your schooling, or your previous experiences, and your passion for the industry or product is what matters the most. And then just nailing the interviews and and doing the right things. Um, and that a certification certainly doesn't hurt; will never hurt. And in some instances, if you have zero experience, it might might show that you have demonstrated some investment in this discipline when you previously didn't have any. Um, but is it going to be, is it going to be a deciding factor between one and another is, is that's going to come down to the interview. Yeah. When I was doing a bunch of discovery to, to launch path, the product, one of the things I kept running into from, from product leaders who were in a hiring position was experience. Like they wanted to see some level of experience. And I'm curious from like your guys' perspective from hiring and just from like a practitioner's level. Like what type of experience on a resume, whether it's side projects or adjacent roles resonates most, or do you think is most transferable into a, a core PM role? Yeah, um, I, I think the most relevant experience is other PM experience for sure. I've kind of come to appreciate my own years in product in different contexts more as time has gone on, whereas I used to be maybe a little bit more uh, confident or perhaps overconfident in, in being able to do the job really well after just a year or two of doing it. Um, I think we talked we talked in the book about some of the different paths uh, that, that folks that we know have taken. I think customer support can be a really good one because you, you develop naturally and you have to have uh, to some extent innately uh, a decent amount of empathy for your customer and the pain points that they're experiencing, which PMs do as well. Um, UX design, I think there's a lot of overlap or gray area between where the UX designer role ends and where the PM role begins these days. So that's kind of an interesting one. Um, engineering for, the, for those, you know, definitely, you know, although we talked a little bit about how valuable it is or isn't to be technical, um, I think engineers coming into a product role have worked with product managers before, have certainly worked in uh, in, in most cases in, uh, in an agile environment, uh, kind of know a lot of things already. So that can be helpful if you have the right mindset and have done your homework. Uh, but yeah, I mean, those are probably the top three that come to mind, but I think you know, QA, sales, like the, almost, almost anything, especially within tech can be, uh, can be a path to product. Yeah, and I will say that my favorite PMs that have, uh, have always been people who haven't had product management before. Um, because I guess if you hire a PM, yeah, you're going to get somebody who knows who's been a PM before, who knows kind of like what they're getting into, but sometimes they'll bring over some bad habits from their previous orgs and like, then those might be tough to train out. And with like, uh, especially for like an associate or a junior level PM, like bringing them, um, somebody with like passion, who's got experience, maybe in engineering, uh, who, who knows how to code, can talk to engineers, has built fake features, but just doesn't want to do that anymore and wants to still wants to stay on the the pod, basically, um, that could be a really great uh, thing to do. One thing we talk about in the book is basically 
the PM superpower. So I think halfway through the book, we're saying, okay, we taught you the fundamentals. Now, how do you think you rank on those fundamentals? Even if you don't have product experience, you probably have product adjacent experience. You probably have used your customer empathy as engineers. The best engineers I've ever met or worked with are looking at the data with how customers are behaving in their, in their, on the features that they write and like care about the fact that it's useful. And if you've done that and you can say that that was your favorite part of the job and that you are passionate about that and that's what you want to do more, that's part of your unique selling point, your, pit, your pitch to the interviewer, the hiring manager to say like, yeah, my lack of direct product experience is made up by the fact that I was basically doing it before and I got this other benefit of being from the engineering background. So like it could, instead of saying it's a shortcoming that you're from an engineer, it's actually probably a benefit um, and to the organization. So like that's just, it's really about reframing that experience that you have rather than trying to excuse it. For sure. So I'm, I'm gonna ask a little bit of a, a self-serving question with the intent to serve others with the answer. Um, so we talked a lot about the importance of discovery and the, the why are you building the thing that you're gonna build and how does it meet a business objective? If someone was working on a side project or something to show as like a potential substitute for former PM experience, how would you like, how would you want that presented to you in a way that it would resonate? Like what are the things in that discovery process you would want to see? Hmm. Uh, Braxton, you want to go first or should I? Yeah, I, I do have some thoughts on, on this one actually. So um, I've been building my team pretty aggressively this year as, as our company has grown and I've talked to a lot of different candidates from a variety of backgrounds and, and uh, different, some of them have been PM, some of them have not, but maybe are trying to switch into it. Um, we, uh, because we're a small company and I think uh, you know our founders are still somewhat involved in the interview process at this point, it's really great to see people who have that entrepreneurial instinct and have um, you know either been a founder in the past, even if it didn't work out or have side projects that they can share. And I think what has been most helpful for us is uh, if they can give us a product demo actually and talk about the you know what inspired them to build that product or solve that problem, uh, some of the challenges that they faced along the way, uh, talk about their users and how they've connected with them um, and maybe some of the, the challenges that uh, have been most difficult for them. The team that they build, if they have one, if not, what did they have to go out and learn in order to bring this thing to life? All that's been really helpful and it helps us uh, it helps us evaluate how that candidate might fit into our team and into our company and what they could bring to the table. Yeah, it's interesting. You, you, see, you do see a lot in the resume stock of people who have founded a company, especially in the Bay Area, um, who are now trying to be in the product management. I think people who are entrepreneurial um, are attracted to the product discipline. I think um, one thing that's a turn off is the resume saying that, oh my God, everything was great. It crushed it. Millions of users making tons of money. It's like, well, if that was the case, then you probably wouldn't be looking for another job, right? <laughs> so we want to... <laughs> I would want to know, like, there's there's a certain level of humility that you need to have as a product manager where you say you don't know everything and that you would you, you do a retro of a feature and say, this is what I would have done differently. And like, if that can come, if like, like Braxton was saying, like having a breakdown of like, hey, this was went right and this is what went wrong and this is what I would do differently in the next time around and how those skills translate into product management and um, how this experience was, you know, I, I was owning this product and um, these are the KPIs I tracked and how I was thinking about success. And we didn't hit success because of X, Y, Z, but um, I still have great learning experience and um, I still have honed some valuable products and skills that I can bring to your team. Like that would be a nice way of, of doing that and doesn't have to be a startup that failed, but a side project, which, you know, like, you know, the what success means is a very different um, definition. And then being uh, humble about that too, and um, demonstrating that would be, you know, valuable conversation, especially at the hiring manager stage, where uh, they're about to put you through the loops. But the, the you know the hiring manager wants to decide if they're going to invest the time to do that, and that might be the appropriate time to do that. As someone who has obviously spent a lot of time on a side project, John, has this been a, a path to product for you? It, it's funny. So going back to the humility thing and, and the, the retro, <laughs> what would I have done differently? So there was a version of Path to Product previous to it called Job Ready. So if you go through my LinkedIn, you'll see it on there. And it was, the scope was way too large. It was like, how can anyone get any job without experience? And it was based on like, I did a whole bunch of research and discovery and it was great. 
um, had a really good idea, um, had partnerships that I was lining up, but the, the engineering partners I had to build it had life circumstances that came up and we ran out of time to actually ship something to market. Like we had a small version of an MVP live, but not able to validate all the things we needed to, to actually like secure capital for it. And I was talking to some, some VC friends that, uh, that I'd met along the way and their advice was like, your, your approach is way too broad, like narrow in your focus, get like, create that beachhead, right? Um, Jeffrey Moore, right? create that beachhead, show some success and then, and then be able to scale out from there, but just don't take such a broad approach so early in the process. And that's, that's where we failed. And so I was like, why not try to start with something that I'm super passionate about and helping the most like ambiguous field to break into, like, let's go tackle that problem and then yeah. expand from there. Nice. Yeah. I like that. That you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, Cool, guys. I appreciate your time. I know we're, we're almost up against the hour. I don't see any more questions in the chat, but um, I know you, you both carved out an hour of your day, which is super valuable. So thanks for coming on to share. And yeah, uh, but, but before we go, where, where can the, the listeners go find product sense? Oh, do you mind if I show off uh, the book really quick? Uh, yeah, do it. Like, just one second. Let me grab a copy. Yeah. Uh, we have a we have a website. It's product sense book dot com. Uh, and it's available on Amazon. I think we also have it in a few bookstores in San Francisco now, and I'm working on New York. So uh, yeah, just kind of, it's only been a couple of weeks, but we're in the early stages of promotion here. So I know it, it looks like that the image is mirrored, so you won't be able to read it directly, but you can see um, this is the book. It's 340 odd pages. Um, the last two, two sections are interviews with some PM leaders and then a PM glossary that you get. So every time we, we, um, we use an industry jargon, uh, we bold it and then define it there and then go and in the back of the book, if you want to reference it, you can, uh, you can always see the, the glossary um, if you ever want to go back, if you, you see something online. We tried to make the book as accessible as possible to people, um, whether you're, you're you know, already a PM or you not, know nothing about it. So that's one of the benefits of this. Um, there's three parts for part one being uh, what should we build and why the number one PM question that um, everyone needs to answer. The second part is about the compass framework, which we talked a little bit about in this section uh, or the session about how to use that to answer the complicated technical PM questions. And then the last part of the book is um, getting the job. So handholding you through the step-by-step -step on what are the steps you need to take to get that job. Um, you, like Braxton said, it's available on Amazon uh, as a print book, um, as well as an ebook, and that if you want to buy locally, you can just go to any local bookstore and then request it. We're in the the, the, the normal databases where the bookstores can um, get their the, get the book shipped from them and, and bypass Amazon. And then in San Francisco, you can find the book in Dog Eared uh, Books and Green Apple Books. Um, it's on the shelves. Um, Very and cool. That, and that anyone can reach out to us if with questions at productsensebook.com. Awesome. Thanks, guys. And uh, two, two orders just happened in the chat. I saw that Ken, a Kindle version was just bought and the hard copy is in route to purchase. So, so there you go. Cool. Well, hope you enjoy it. For sure. Th thanks again for your time. And uh, until next time, we thank everybody for joining. And uh, we'll see you next week on Lessons in Product Management. Take care. Thanks, John. Cheers all.